Welcome to this episode of Kill the Cat, where we're discussing the role of the MCU's biggest purple baddie, Thanos, in Avengers Infinity War and Endgame. We'll be discussing Thanos' holy quest to save the universe by killing half of it, and how you can use these ideas to make your own villains both more compelling and a bigger obstacle for your heroes. Now, enjoy the episode. So, today we are talking about Infinity War. We are. We're doing a Marvel movie. I'm so excited. Hooray. Um, so, Ebby, we're, we're a serious screenwriting filmmaking podcast. Mm-hmm. What are we doing, doing a Marvel movie? They're good movies, and <laughs> anyone who says otherwise is lying. Um, yeah. Look, I- not all of them. But there have been some really solid movies with a lot to take away from. I've definitely heard people critique them and say they're not good movies, and I would disagree. I adore the Marvel movies and the Marvel Cinematic Universe in general. I would argue they haven't made a bad movie. They've made some mediocre movies and some forgettable Mm. movies, but none of them are bad. And for like, what are they up to? Like 30-something movies? That's incredibly impressive. No, I'm fully on board. And I kind of feel like sometimes... The go-to thing, like the trendy thing to do right now is to bash Marvel movies or like sometimes feel like people say superhero movies and Marvel movies and mean the same thing. Mm. I can find that a little bit frustrating because there's a lot of average superhero movies, but I feel like the Marvel ones tend to be better. Not always. There's some great DC ones out there as well. But yeah, I really like them and I think they have a lot more to offer than what people give them credit for. And I think they automatically get dismissed as something like blockbustery and like popular and therefore not worth analyzing like we're about to do today and yeah hopefully we can prove them wrong i think it's interesting as well like the movies have gotten better over oh yeah time. so much uh, better I, like i'm interested to see what happens with phase four now that they've kind of really rounded out the main storyline of the avengers but infinity war and endgame were an amazing duo to round out what had been what, 20 movies? I I think there's heaps to take away from how they ended it, how they rounded it out. And so we're going to talk today about Thanos and his role in Avengers Infinity War. I think he's been talked about a lot. The filmmakers wanted to make the film about him, and he is the one who kind of goes through the Holy Quest uh, well, what we're calling the Holy Quest, but the um, hero's journey through the film. It kind of, like, when you break that apart, really the elements just all point to Thanos being the main character of the film. He's the one who has the victory at the end. Yeah, so this is one of the ones we were tossing around ideas for podcast episodes and we're talking about Avengers. Um, And as our conversations often do, they ended up on the topic of Dungeons and Dragons instead. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, the idea of like, is Thanos a paladin came up? Just that question. Um, Yeah, we think he is. So for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, um, go start go play playing Dungeons D&D and Dragons because it's the yeah. best. Um, so a paladin in Dungeons and Dragons is a holy warrior that is devoted to a god and follows a certain quest. Not even a god in um, D and D. Like it's a someone who is so devoted to an ideal, mm. um, and usually that's linked to one of the gods of the pantheon. But it doesn't have to be. But it is. They are so set on a certain ideal that that gives them powers and allows them to fight for that holy thing that they're seeking to fight for. Yeah, I'm I'm playing one right now in the campaign Ibi is running. Uh, it's different, but it's fun. Mm. Um, I started off as a rogue, and then after our first party kill, I was like, hmm, what's the opposite of a rogue? A paladin, and now I'm a paladin. So anyway, <laughs> and what is a Holy Quest movie? Because we tried to think of a few, and we struggled yeah, I don't think I could think of any, though I'm sure there are some out there and someone will have seen some. Yeah, the closest I got was like The Last Crusade, like Indiana Jones, or like Monty Python and the Holy Grail. But they're not mm. really holy quests in the way we're going to talk about a holy quest. Yeah, I think you um, put down in your notes like the Odyssey and sort of some of the stories from, I guess, Greek mythology, I guess the idea of the holy quest was a much bigger concept in those times and just maybe in literature is a bit more of a common genre and theme that you see and it's not something you get to see in films a whole lot 
part of making your characters interesting and three-dimensional is giving them flaws and our weaknesses in how they operate and that's hard to do when also giving them a quest that could be considered holy and sort of serves a higher good right like if you have something that is objectively good and the morally right thing to do well you can't really make conflict a through just doing that all the time you kind of have to give your character a desire to not do that so when you have a character who is all in for their holy quest how do you make that interesting uh and i think that's the challenge with writing someone like thanos and i think that's something you can learn from this movie is how to write someone like thanos well yeah the idea of like how do you make someone like that interesting i think the answer to that is make them the villain Mm. um so he is the big bad of uh, the first three phases of MCU, he first shows up at the end of Avengers from 2012, and every movie is building up to this. So the general idea is there are six Infinity Stones. He needs all six. Once he gets them, he's going to snap his fingers and eliminate half of all life in the universe. This is his mm. holy quest. So yeah, we talked a, bit, a little bit about how this is, especially Infinity War, it's Thanos's movie and he gets the hero's journey, which we're going to touch on a little bit. We do feel like this has been covered by other people quite a lot. Yeah. Um, so we're going, to, but we're going to start there because it is a good way to describe like this holy quest idea. So then that brings the question of like, how do you define a holy quest over just a regular quest? Uh, I think for me, what I kind of came down to is a, it is still a quest. So all your standard quest things still stand like um the quest taker has to undergo trials and they need to undergo sacrifice there's the classic idea of the sort of leaving home and the return to home which comes out of the hero's journey Uh, i think those parts of the quest are still very much part of the holy quest i think what makes the holy quest slightly different is that it's a quest that serves a higher cause or greater good so It goes beyond just the desires of the character. So in this case, you look at Thanos. He's not actually looking for power or anything like that. He just wants to make the world better and is willing to do the sort of hard thing that needs to be done in his eyes to make that happen. And, uh, you know, he's willing to make the sacrifices. And that's the other point I had is that in a holy quest, you kind of have to, there's almost more of a sense of sacrifice of yourself and of that which you love, right? Like you have to be willing to give up your own desires in order to see that greater good. And that is, again, what makes it kind of a holy quest. Yeah. So we say like he gets an arc. He's definitely the one on the journey. And then the Avengers in this film their stories are just centered around stopping Thanos. And yeah, I just think it's such smart writing because when you have however many characters you have in Infinity War, like you look at the poster and it's insane, just how many characters are in this. And I'm just imagining like, how would you even put that movie together? And I think by giving, you're like, this is the bad guy, this is his journey, and then fitting in the other characters around that, that's smart writing. Yeah, they become side characters, which means you don't have to give each of them a fully formed arc. Your main arc is Thanos, and you can actually use all your other characters to kind of further his arc, which sort of happens with the different groups that we see interacting with Thanos throughout. I think it's interesting as well, even though it's a movie about Thanos, the first half of the movie is still spent setting up a lot of the non-Thanos characters, like there's that many of them. I kind of went into the movie watching it again with this idea that Thanos was the main character and it was interesting to find that really we start to focus on his journey about halfway through. So when he takes Gamora and really when he gets Gamora to um, to where the Soul Stone is, I can't remember the name of it, but that's kind of really where the movie then becomes completely the movie about Thanos. Yeah, and I think the first half... Going back to the idea of like, what information do you need? Essentially, there are kind of three stories going on that are going to stop Thanos. So there's Mm. Tony Stark, um, Peter Parker, and Doctor Strange who meet up with kind of half of the Guardians. The Donut Boys, I think you called them. The Donut Boys. (laughs) It's in the Flying Space Donut. They're the Donut Boys. It's fair. So it's them. 
Uh, there's Steve Rogers and kind of like the rogue Avengers who meet up with T'Challa in Wakanda. Mm-hmm. There's that battle. And then there's Thor going off with Rocket and Groot to get Stormbreaker, which is kind of his own holy quest, which is interesting. Yeah, I think Thor has one of the biggest story arcs outside of Thanos in this film. Um, and it's a wonderful arc that pays off beautifully at the end uh, in that it kind of doesn't. And we see that then in Endgame as well, like the effects of him having gone on this massive arc in this movie just to have failed. Yeah, I mean, Infinity War is kind of a movie about failure, really. Mm. Which I think, again, like going back to Thanos' story, like he's the hero, he gets to win. Yeah. He's the main character, he gets to complete his quest, um, which means the Avengers lose. I was fortunate enough, I did watch Infinity War towards the end of its run, but managed to avoid spoilers. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. That scene where they... And, I, like, I'd heard a lot of, like, it's a lot. It's really sad. I was yeah. like, okay, I guess someone dies. One person might die. <laughs> nope. Oh, uh, no. No, it's so... It's so brutal. Because he comes and it's, like... It's just all that stuff building up to it. And when Thor completes his quest, or he thinks he does... Mm-hmm. He should have gone for the head. But he should have gone oh. for the head. I'm just getting, like, flashbacks to seeing this for the first time. Um, oh. And how devastating it was. Yeah. So the good guys don't get as much of a kind of focus in this movie because it really is they need to fail for this movie. Yeah. I was actually really impressed with, like, Infinity War. Out of Infinity War and Endgame, Infinity War is definitely the more action-packed. It's the funnier movie. It's the kind of the flashier movie, which ends mm. with the heroes failing. And then I loved how most of Endgame was very introspective and like reflective and a lot, it was a lot more like... It's quite somber. It was a much quieter, somber movie until the big battle at the end. But even like when they're going back in time to get the stones, they're not fighting for the stones. They're mostly just having conversations. Yeah. Um, anyway, and I love that that was the movie where they win mm-hmm. and then the action pa- packed Infinity War is the one where they lose. I just, again, smart writing, interesting writing, and like subverting the genre. Yeah, totally. And this whole movie is like a subversion of a genre that all the other movies have established. Kind of the superhero genre has a little bit been defined, at least in our modern sense, by the Marvel movies. Oh, yeah, definitely. And they noticed that, I think, about Phase 3, when people say, like, Marvel movies aren't that good or they're all the same, I honestly think they're thinking of Phase 2. Because I've, Phase 1 is, like, solid, but it, it's a lot of, like, a very typical three-act, yeah, like, hero's journey for each of them. And then Phase 2 is a bit all over the place, I think, with the exception of The Winter Soldier and Guardians of the Galaxy. And then I think they got to Phase 3 and, like, here are our mistakes. Well, not mistakes, but like, here are the criticisms we're getting. So, like, one of them I like is, like, everything ends with a sky beam and an alien army. And then Civil War is, like, we're going to end with these three characters you love fighting each other. Yeah. Yeah, and then this one was, like, it is going to be huge and there's going to be battles and the heroes and they're all going to team up and they're going to lose. No, I think it's brilliant writing. And I think it, it, it made Thanos so much more compelling and he made it so much more compelling. Why don't we bring it back I guess, to Thanos and look at a few of the sort of things that made him as compelling as he was. Because that is, I guess, we've talked about the Holy Quest and the fact that he's on one. Um, But I think there's things that went into making him more compelling than, say, other villains who have kind of had those Holy Quest motifs as well. Uh, Even within the series, there's like Killmonger. Yeah, and we will talk about Killmonger a little bit as the villain who's most similar to Thanos. Hmm. Um, there isn't really any others in the series like them. Like a lot of the villains, I actually divided them into categories. There's like ones that want like money or like selfish motivations. That's like a lot of Iron Man's villains. Mm-hmm. And then a lot of Captain America's villains wants to like dominate the world and like have power. That's like Hydra and Red Skull. Um, yep. And then there's revenge plots like Loki or Ghost. Mm-hmm. Um, so this was just a completely different way. And in my notes I had... Uh, this idea of this villain who cannot be threatened with, bargained with, or reasoned with. There's nothing you can say because he thinks he's so right and that he's going to save the universe. He gets nothing out of it. 
Like, he, he knows he's going to lose everything to do it. Like, that's a scary villain. Yeah. And, like, um, one of my favorite things that came out of this, the movie, was um, the fact that there was a hashtag, like, Thanos did nothing yeah. wrong. And there's all these Facebook groups. And it's, like, his arguments, like, his whole goal, there's not enough resources to for everyone to live, so kill half of the people, and suddenly there's double the resources per person. That's logic that is well argued but he's not doing it to gain power or anything with that like his whole goal is to cleanse the world i think he says at one point and then retire right like to watch the sun rise on a grateful universe and he actually goes about this quest regardless of the infinity stones as well so you know thanos's quest begins well before the avengers you know even as far back as gamora being a child he goes to these planets he'll conquer them you kill half the people, you'll move to the next planet. And when the Infinity Stones become available to him, his goal changes to, I will get the Infinity Stones and with a snap of my finger, do this. And that's mercy. And so actually he is looking for the best, most merciful way to accomplish his goal. It's just his goal is terrible and a big price to pay. And we see that he's willing to go further than sort of anyone else is to accomplish his goal. We were talking before, you made a note of like, at every point with the stones, someone gets threatened. Yeah, so basically throughout Infinity War, every time a stone is lost, like every time like a stone goes to Thanos, the Avengers kind of have a choice. Do they save someone they care about or do they give Thanos the stone? Uh, So that's the first scene of the movie. Loki gives up the Tesseract to save Thor. Uh, later, Gamora gives up the Soul Stone to save Nebula. Doctor Strange gives it up to save Tony. Um, and then there's also the one on Earth, which is in Vision's forehead. And there's like an option early on, like we can kill Vision and destroy the stone and they decide not to do that. And then towards yeah. the end in the big battle, Vision is safe in the Wakandan palace and comes out because he sees that Steve's about to die and saves him. And that ends up with Thanos killing him and getting the stone. And that's the opposite of the choice Thanos makes. Yeah, he has Gamora, who is like one of the only people he's ever properly loved, threatened in order for him to receive the stone. And he kills her because for him, this quest is so much bigger than him. And his own desires and goals are not worth sacrificing the quest. Yeah. And it is set up like she is the most important thing in the world to him. Um, And when he kills her, like he's crying. It's not callous it's not i have to it's just yeah it's a sacrifice it's a sacrifice it's painful i honestly think like after you see that happen you're like okay literally nothing is gonna stop this guy unless except like literally just killing him which has been proved to be okay difficult to begin with and then every time he gets another stone it just becomes harder Uh, so when he comes yeah to the earth and he has five of them and he just has one more to go. And he's got an army coming for him. But you're like, he has five stones and he's Thanos and you can't change his mind. What What are you going to do? Oh, Thor's here. Nope. <laughs> yeah. Well, I find it interesting because there's actually a number of false victories for the Avengers and false defeats for Thanos, which is, you know, brilliant writing as well. One of the earlier ones is Star-Lord trying to kill Gamora. And Thanos bends reality. Or actually, even Thanos being stabbed by... um, I can't remember who stabs him. But he gets killed. And then he warps reality and shows that uh, that was all an illusion. I'm actually alive. And he takes Gamora. But then towards the end, you've got Wanda kills Vision and destroys the stone in order to stop Thanos. And Thanos just comes in with the time stone and rewinds it and kills Vision again. And it's like this terrible, horrible moment. And then, you know, one of my favorite moments from the film is Thor coming like down from the sky and throwing Stormbreaker at Thanos and it just lodging in his chest. Um, That whole exchange, you know, it's right at the end of the movie. It's the big victory moment for the Avengers. It's like, yes, they've won. And then should have gone for the head snap and they've lost again, just playing with the idea of who will actually win in this scenario because both sides have kind of earned themselves a right to claim the victory and it's who will actually get it. The main character. Yeah. There's one other villain in the MCU that kind of has this journey. Definitely one of the best villains, which is Eric Killmonger 
from Black Panther. Mm -hmm. So him as well, like, if you take Killmonger's journey and his storyline out of Black Panther, he definitely looks like the hero. So his father is killed, and then he goes away and he trains to come back to Wakanda to take what he thinks is his rightful place as king. And also, like, he has good intentions. It's not just about power. His whole thing is how dare you hide away in Wakanda with all your wealth and all your technology when our African descendants are suffering in the world and you're not doing anything about it and I'm going to come and change that. So we thought we'd talk a little bit about that and how he's similar and different to Thanos. Yeah, because I think there's some key differences. For me, I liked Killmonger, but I felt like he wasn't as compelling of a villain as Thanos is. And I think, you know, that's a hard ask for any villain to be as compelling as Thanos. In terms of similarities, right, like he is, he believes he's the hero and he's fully convinced that what he's doing is right. And by all means, you could actually make an argument that he is. Someone pointed out that at some point that he's basically Batman. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yep, okay. In a way. And I think the other thing with him is that he, his quest is also goes beyond himself, right? Like it's, uh, it's about the greater good uh, I think where the two divide for me, where Thanos and Killmonger have a big difference, is that Thanos doesn't desire the power. Like, his goal is just to retire once he's done. Killmonger seems to be much more enamored with the idea of being king, uh, and he gives into that craving a bit more, right? Like, his goal isn't just to get the Wakandan technology out. His goal is to then rule Wakanda and arm everyone and go take over the world kind of thing. Like, it, there's a bit more self-serving goals. Yeah. And part of the reason we wanted to bring up Killmonger is this idea of, like, going back to Thanos as someone who can't really be beaten and Killmonger is. Killmonger fails because he gives in to personal desires and, like, he's passionate about what he wants. Thanos is not passionate about what he wants. He's very removed and very dispassionate. It's interesting because he's he almost has to be right. Like he acknowledges in the movie, like this is a terrible thing to have to do, but I'm the only one who can do it, so I have to do it. Like I think ultimately Thanos would much rather not have to do this. Yeah, heroic sacrifice in his mind. Whereas I think if Killmonger, Thanos, if he didn't have the inciting seeing his world grow up in poverty, if that wasn't a problem for him, he would never go on his quest. I think if Killmonger had maybe not seen the poverty but had known he was Wakandan, I still think he might have gone and tried to claim the throne. Mm. Like, like just in terms of their motivations, I feel like there was always that desire to jump on the quest, if you will. There's also the idea that Thanos refers to everyone as his child. Mm. Um, so in the beginning, he's like his followers are called the children of Thanos. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he doesn't see himself as, like, a king or a conqueror. He's a father. Yeah. Like, children has implications of love and care and nurture. And that's kind of how he sees himself, like, he's nurturing the universe. It's also just kind of creepy. But anyway. A little bit. <laughs> when he calls Wanda my child, when he's just met her, I'm like, stop. <laughs> um, Something I realized when watching this movie as well is that Thanos... Uh, in Infinity War and Thanos in Endgame are also very different. I think Thanos in Infinity War is a much more compelling villain than Thanos in Endgame. Mm. And I think part of the reason for that is that in Endgame, his mission, while it is to get the Infinity Stones, it is also to stop himself from being defeated. And so it's almost that like the quest becomes more about him than about the greater good or the greater story. And he becomes a bit more passionate about that revenge, right? I don't know if you have thoughts on that, but I think that's a really interesting, like, why is it that in one movie he's really compelling and in the other movie he's not? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting idea, going back to the, the idea, like, of someone who can't be defeated. And that's kind of true. Even in Infinity War, he goes off to retire, and then in the beginning of Endgame, that same Thanos gets beheaded by Thor. But that's not a victory. Like, yeah, they kill him. They don't defeat him. I think that bringing him back in Endgame, the younger version of him, yeah, some of those flaws and, like, the desire for revenge and the passion, 
that has defeated other villains like Killmonger is slightly like starting to creep through. Yeah. And that hubris becomes his undoing, like no one can beat me. And yeah, Tony Stark can because he's beaten him before. And I love that Tony Stark loses to um, him the first time because they can't get the gauntlet off his off his hand because they're trying to take it away. And he's like, okay, I can't do that, but I can take the stones off the gauntlet. I think it's also interesting, like, Tony Stark is the choice for the person who does the click at the end of Endgame. He is kind of the anti-Thanos of that movie, right? Like, this is a Thanos who has had a Holy Quest and was on that, but has kind of started to give in to his own desires and has fallen away from the holy side of the quest. Whereas Tony has been the person who's always been about himself and what he wants and what he thinks is right and you know, that's his whole thing, has finally reached the point where he is more about everyone else than he is about himself. Yeah, and I think there's actually some interesting similarities between Thanos and Tony Stark. Like, Tony Stark identifies as a futurist who's someone who, like, makes predictions for the future and, like, this is what's going to happen and this is how we should react depending on this. And you can see Mm. this um, in, like, Age of Ultron, like, building Ultron... Um, and le- then later, like, signing the accord. So he's like, I'm doing this terrible thing because it's going to prevent something worse from happening. Uh, so yeah. I actually think that he and Thanos share, a, like, a similar mindset when it comes to that kind of stuff. And I think what it comes down to, why Tony gets to beat him... I mentioned earlier, like, Thanos calls himself a father. Tony Stark has... He's learning to be a father in Infinity War um, with Peter Parker and then becomes a father to Morgan in Endgame. And going back to that idea of, like, for Thanos, it's all about the quest. No one matters, not even Gamora, versus the Avengers who are like, I will save one person and risk the universe. I think what what is particularly, like, scary and compelling about someone who gets caught up in this holy quest is they can only see the big picture, which is what Tony Stark used to do. And going mm. back to that idea of the individual and not sacrificing someone you love, even if it might mean that the villain gets an Infinity Stone. And I think there's an interesting moment in Infinity War. So earlier in the movie, like Doctor Strange, like he straight up says to like Tony, if it comes down to you or to Peter, I'm going to choose the Time Stone. Just so you know, I'm not going to save you. Um, and it's that big picture thing of like, I can't sacrifice one life to save the universe. But when it comes down mm. to it and he's seen into the future, and he's like, there is one scenario where we win and it's where Tony Stark saves us. Um, and he makes the choice. He's like, spare his life. I will give you the time stone. And it's this idea of not sacrificing the, un- the universe for an individual because that individual might be the one to save the universe. When I think of... Um compelling villains one of the other villains i find really compelling is the complete opposite of thanos is it the joker um no uh (laughs) it's kilgrave from jessica jones okay i found in my mind he was one of the most terrifying villains in a show or anything like that because you couldn't stop him and also just that like whatever he wanted he could get and so he's kind of the opposite of thanos in that he is completely driven by selfish ambition and maybe this is a point for another episode or something but there's the flip side of the villain right like the one who can't be stopped but is completely driven by his own ambition versus the one who can't be stopped but is completely driven by the greater purpose yeah i was actually trying to think of other villains like thanos who just want to save and protect the world without any individual gain. I couldn't think of any, but the closest I could come up with was um, the Joker, specifically the Heath Ledger variation from the Christopher Nolan movies. He doesn't have a quest, but he has a calling and it's chaos. And that's all he cares about. And it's, I think we're hitting on like a theme here of the villain you can't like reason with, you can't buy off. Joker's whole thing is... I want the world to be chaos and that's it. Or like Moriarty from like BBC Sherlock, I think would be another one. Like, um, yeah, I just want to have fun. I don't care. So you take someone like that and then give them great intellect or great strength like Thanos has. Looking at Moriarty, right? Like power in the show Sherlock is intelligence. Yes. Um, That's what Sherlock is. And so Moriarty has that as well. In the Avengers, power is powers and actual strength and, you know, shooting lasers and what have you and i think it kind of works that thanos is just like 
this massive purple guy who is kind mm. of resilient to all the various heroes' powers. Yeah, and as he gets the gauntlet and the infinity stones, right? Like he, like they're actually interesting powers he starts to get and be able to use. Yeah, and they set that up in the first scene. Like he goes toe to toe with the Hulk and wins. Yeah. I'm pretty sure Hulk is, there's even a joke about it in Thor Ragnarok, has been the strongest Avenger we've seen so far, at, at least physically. Doesn't he, like, throw him across a room or something? Like, yeah. He, like, takes a couple of hits, but then, like, pretty easily takes him down after that. Yeah, and he goes up against, like, Tony Stark in the most advanced suit of armor we've seen him in yet, and Doctor Strange, and Peter Parker, and half of the Guardians of the Galaxy, and they get one drop of blood. Like between them. Yeah, they make him bleed, and it's like, all this for a drop of blood, and that's it. That's all the damage they do to him. Yeah, and then he proceeds to drop a moon on Tony. If you throw another moon at me, I'm going to lose it. (laughs) I think one of my big takeaways is just uh, on writing your villains or your antagonists. A villain doesn't have to be wanting to end the world or kill people, right? Like, just the idea of writing an antagonist in your story that is as compelling, if not more so, than your protagonists. But also, yeah, like the idea of making them, I guess, unstoppable in their beliefs. Yeah. Um, going back to D&D as well, I found the best way to plan a Dungeons & Dragons session because uh, you never really know what the players are going to do and you don't want to force them to do things. So now when I go in for planning, I'm like, I don't know what my players are going to do, but I know what my villains are doing and I know their motivations. And so taking that idea and just remembering that your antagonist also has a story and they're probably the hero in their own story. And it can be fun to write characters that are openly evil or openly flawed. But what do you do when you take all that away and you have a villain who wants what they think is right? Mm. And how do you fight someone like that? Yeah, Thanos is almost a unflawed character who believes fully in a flawed ideal. Yeah, and I think there's some real world comparisons out there. Terrorists, ISIS, just these people who are ideologically fixed on an idea and don't really care Mm. who gets hurt in their pursuit of it. That can be very scary. I actually think it's the scariest villain you can write, except maybe for someone like Kilgrave or like the Joker who's out of their minds. But it's kind of that similar idea mm. of they don't have a weakness you can exploit. You just have to overpower them and be smarter than them. And you don't know if the heroes can do that. And in Infinity War, they can't. Mm. They lose. My other takeaway is don't dismiss Marvel movies because there might be more in them than you thought. There's a lot in them. <laughs> I think I'm going to go rewatch Marvel again after we finish recording because <laughs> now I want to go watch it again. The whole thing, just from the beginning? Yeah, well, I've got to use my quarantine for something, so... True. Enjoy your quarantine. Until next time. Until next time. That was our episode on Thanos and writing a villain with a holy quest. If you liked the episode and want to hear more, make sure to hit that subscribe button and click the bell to receive notifications of upcoming episodes. We've got movies such as Arrival, The Lego Movies, Enchanted, The Platform, and John Wick coming up. Until next time, this has been Kill the Cat. Did that make any sense? Or is that just me rambling? The... Wait, no, I had such a good point. Go, don't, don't leave my head. Um. <laughs>